Okay, so um, good afternoon. Um, on Thursday this week, I'll be giving a speech setting out some of the next steps in the government's public sector program. Uh, delivering better public services within tight financial constraints is one of our four priorities for this term. The other priorities are responsibly managing the government's finances, building a more competitive and productive economy, and of course rebuilding Christchurch. Personally, I want a results-focused public service that embraces innovation and flexibility, and is accountable for delivering the results New Zealanders want and of course deserve. My speech this week will cover some of the next steps to achieve this and clearly set out the government's expectations. I don't want to go into details today, but I can make a few general points. Firstly, improving the public service is important because the public service um, makes up about a quarter of New Zealand's economy, so it plays a big part in our overall economic performance. New Zealanders care about the quality of public services they receive, hospitals for their families, education for their children, and social services, justice uh, for the most vulnerable. And taxpayers who pay the bills quite rightly expect their money to be spent carefully. With those things in mind, over the past three years we have focused on two things, reducing costs and increasing efficiency in the public service, and getting better results and improved levels of service. Instead of rushing in and making savage cuts, we've given public service chief executives time to prepare and plan for the new reality of delivering better public services with little or no new money, for, and for example through the four year budget planning process. We're making good progress in reducing costs and increasing efficiency as we focus on getting back to service in 2014-15. Now we want to focus hard on delivering better results, improving public services for New Zealanders and being more flexible and innovative in how we do that. We've always said that there'll be a high hurdle for structural change in the public sector. Uh, my speech is not going to be about a mergers uh, for mergers sake. Uh, so we're not looking at wholesale restructuring, but there is one area of the public sector's operations where we think that structural change is needed. But I'll talk more about that uh, and how we'll get better results in my speech on Thursday. Just in terms of ministerial activity, obviously it's a recess week, I'm in Auckland tomorrow, Wednesday I'm in Taupo, Thursday I'm in Auckland, and Friday I'm in the Coromandel Electric. On Sunday I'll be at the start of round the Bays race in Auckland, I'll be going to the Warriors match uh, and do some other things on Sunday. What's that area? Have to wait till Thursday. Is that the super ministry around the economic development, science, innovation, labour, and immigration? Well, not going to rule that out, but I'm also not going to rule it in. Why would there be a better um, way of approaching that area? Yeah, well, uh, I'm not going to go into the particular areas that we're looking at. What I'm saying in the speech on Thursday quite clearly is that the public have high expectations of the public service, uh, that I don't think we should just have mergers for the sake of them. Where we've had mergers so far in areas like the Ministry for Primary Industries, it's been very logical in what we've done. There's one other particular area we want to focus on um, in, in terms of uh, where we think gains can be made and synergies can be found. And I'll be in a position to talk more about that on Thursday. Do you think these money and fewer people have been Better public services. Well, I think we need to modernise the state service, uh, and it's really important that we deliver um, on a number of things. Firstly, New Zealanders have high expectations of the results they get. So when we think of public services, some people think about how you apply for your passport. Actually, I think about whether kids get a decent education, whether the justice system works for them. Secondly, uh, a big driver of costs is headcount. And of course we're giving a lot of government departments no extra money. So where they're having to pay for wage rounds, that's leaving them effectively out of pocket and having to make savings in other areas. Thirdly, there are synergies to be gained when you share back offices, when you share support services. We've also been wanting to move resources from the back office to the front office and I think we've been quite successful about that. So, um, you know, yes, the headcount has been fallen in the state sector, I don't think dramatically, but it has been coming down. Um, it's my expectation it will probably go a bit lower, uh, but I'm not foreshadowing absolutely dramatic change, but I am foreshadowing sensible change. So, I mean, I think there are 2,400 um, jobs lost since you guys have gone. Do you expect a similar level um, of job loss in the next three years to reach it? Uh, well, the, the savings for the billion dollars will come not solely through a reduction in headcount, although that is a part of the cost savings that we will receive. Um, there are other areas like procurement that we, we, we can save money, um, other things that we're doing. So you know, we'll spell that out a bit more holistically. So how many jobs do you think there's 
carried on to it will go across the city. I don't know precisely. Um, I can see some areas where there's going to be structural change and I can see some areas where there's some savings going on, but really every government department is looking at it. Is it hundreds or is it thousands? I mean, how do you, how, how the public going to handle how business is going to be? Well, as I said, it's, it's not change for the sake of change and it's not driven by a magic number. It's driven by a better result in a more affordable environment. I don't think you'd actually say we've had tremendous pushback in defence. Um, yes, morale is arguably at a slightly lower level, but it's still from quite a high base. Um, and actually, if you look at defence, um, one of the strong themes that came through when we did the defence white paper was they want more money to spend on um, different assets and on and in different areas. And so in the case of defence, yes, they're making savings, but they get to use all of those savings and other initiatives that they want to fund. So um, there may be some people who are unhappy, but I wouldn't necessarily describe the whole defence force as unhappy. In the case of NFAT, yes, it's slightly different. There obviously has been some pushback, but the important point to note with NFAT is we are going through a consultation process. The, legal, the, the, the chief executive is legally required to do that and it's legally required to take on board that feedback. And um, I mentioned he will. Are you going to back away from some of your proposals around impact? Well, I think it's really important to understand that the chief executives, um, that is the responsibility of a neutral state sector. Uh, but I think he will take on board the feedback and I'd be amazed if he, if he ends up delivering on all the things he's consulting on. I think there will be some change, but that's a matter for him. Will you think that's a change in like that? Uh, I don't want to foreshadow that today. I mean, he hasn't even finished the consultation process, but uh, you know, we, we value the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, but we are trying to modernise it. Are you still aggressive by um, chief executive <coughs> by the minister if we have a job? Do you think it was too big, too soon? Well, firstly, it's clearly run by the chief executive. I mean, the State Secretary Act is absolutely crystal clear in terms of whose obligations and responsibilities uh, uh, they are to reform the state sector. Um, are they too aggressive? Look, in some areas they might be one of, they might be a little bit aggressive and we might have to step back a little bit. So there was no government direction at impact to find cost savings? This is completely off your own initiative? No, they need to find cost savings. That's not the directive. The directive is how you find those cost savings. We are the purchasing agent. So it's quite within the state sector act for a minister to give an indication of where the government's going. We've been doing that for quite some time, telling chief executives they need to live within the baseline. It's no different from us going to police and saying to the police commissioner, there'll be no extra money for this budget cycle, as we have said to the police commissioner. But it's for the police commissioner, rightfully, to identify where those savings might be found to fund the other cost increases that he faces within both police. You just said that you want to foreshadow areas we think that might might fall back, but then saying it's totally out of the end of the neutral chief executive. So, are you aware of Well, I'm well and truly aware of the feedback. I mean, anyone can see that. Um, and there, there is an intranet site where NFAT employees are being encouraged to go out and give their feedback. I think the spouses of NFAT staff have released a, a letter today, an open letter today, as I understand it. I mean, I'd be absolutely amazed if the chief executive doesn't take that on board because there's a legal <coughs> obligation to do that. There will be no direction from the government. Well, the government's the purchaser, and we want to see an efficient state uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade that, that works well, and we want, want to see one that achieves the objective we've got, which is to reduce their costs and be modernised. How that's carried out is a matter for uh, the chief executive. You said that some of the proposals might be too aggressive, but in fact, what areas are you talking about? I think some around compensation are likely to be a bit aggressive. I mean, at the end of the day, there are genuine uh, uh, issues here. Um, spouses do accompany their partner more often than not on a foreign posting, and they don't always get the opportunity to take up employment in, that, in the locations they go to. So I think that's one area uh, where he'll have a look. But as I say, that's, uh, I've had lots of anecdotal feedback to me as well. I'm sure that same feedback has been fed into the system in the end. I'm sure John Allen will go and work his way through all that and eventually come up with a set of proposals that he thinks fits what's required. There's a sense, sorry, there's a sense of the um, process to uh, appoint a new uh, Chief Executive Department of Labour has been suspended. Is that due to the proposed changes in terms of micro no, I don't think so. Um, I certainly haven't seen a new recommendation, but uh, they, they worked their way through that. It's been one of the other recommendations, but they haven't got
Welcome to the head. And if you've got on speculation about the Super Ministry around the economic development, immigration, labour, you said you didn't want to put with it, it's not happening, but you want to announce something, is it? I'll just repeat what I said earlier, which is I'm not ruling anything in, and I'm not ruling it out. I'm happy to talk about it on Thursday. If you want to speculate it before then, I can't stop TV3 doing that. What would No, and I encourage you to go and read the State Sector Act. It lays out quite clearly whose responsibilities uh, they are and who uh, is required to carry out um, any of the things that take place. I mean, if, if ministers are going to do that, then they'll very quickly find themselves in breach of the State Sector Act. It's quite clear the government has less money and is either asking some of the parties to live with less money or the same amount of money. That's absolutely within our prerogative. Um, it's also in our prerogative as the purchaser <coughs> to make it clear what our objectives are. But it's the responsibility of the chief executive to come up with that plan and to execute that plan. So when uh, Mr McCarty says that he didn't want to see any cuts to the UN, for instance, that's part of the government's What's definition of what its priorities are. That's his definition of, of as the purchaser of what he thinks is important. It's the responsibility, I would have thought, of any good chief executive to work with their minister and say, what are you trying to achieve and what are you trying to, to uh, what do you see as a priority? That's why uh, there's a briefing to the incoming minister. That's why ministers meet with chief executives on a weekly basis. But the actual plan and how that plan is executed is the legal responsibility of the chief executive. But the problem is, especially credibility that far to think that the minister, especially one as, as active, if you like, as Mr McCulley, would allow a proposal to get as far as this without at least having some input into what it said the direction it's taking beyond the, the, the level that you're talking about? Well, you need to take that question up directly with the Minister, uh, but certainly in terms of discussions I've had with the Minister, um, he has certainly given, uh, given clear indications of what his purchasing requirements are, but my understanding is the programme and plan that's been put together was formed by the Chief Executive with the change consultants that he employed. Well, was it just um, changing the subject? Just looking at the investor plus category oh, for yeah. immigration, with just 10 people, including Google.com, coming in on that. Are you happy with that, with the way that that scheme has been working? Has that been as effective as you would like? Well, it's more successful than the previous scheme was, and it's seen, uh, for the most part, people coming to New Zealand that are making a real contribution. And you know, whether ultimately Kim.com has breached um, international law is not a matter for me to opine on. That's a matter for uh, the US authorities who are taking that case. Uh, but in terms of the general category, actually having high net worth individuals coming to New Zealand, in my view, adds value. You've seen that with Julian Robinson, you've seen it, uh, I think you'll see it with James Cameron when he comes. And in fact, the Herald today ran, I thought, quite an interesting piece on the number of you know, high net worth individuals that are coming and what they're doing in New Zealand. What about the fact that most of them have just invested the $10 million and no more, effectively, they've just stopped once they've, you know, once they've well, I think it's a very narrow definition of what they're actually doing. Um, so they might be just that in their bonds or whatever it might be, but in fact their overall activities are usually significantly greater than that. So that goes with the fact that lots of them are 77% of the money in, in bonds, very passive for They do, but they more often go off and do a, a great many other things. I mean, uh, look, it's not for me to go into the individual activities of a, of a person, but if you take Peter Thiel, for instance, from Facebook, who's, who's spent some time in New Zealand, it's very well known. He makes a significant donation to Christchurch. He's been undertaking a number of, of his own standard private investments in, in different activities. Um, he's doing quite a lot of things in New Zealand. He's just one example of many high net worth individuals who, um, I don't know where he's, he might be investing $10 million in terms of that scheme. There's overall activities in New Zealand are recently So, so Peter Field came in under this category? I don't know, but he's that type of person. Yeah. So the, Probably. the gains are beyond what, what they... Well, are. that's my view. Um, I mean, you're never going to have thousands of people in this category, but you are going to have some very important people. And, you know, Julian Robinson has given the single biggest donation of art in Australasian history. We gave him an honorary knighthood for that. New Zealand will be better off to the tune of well over a hundred million dollars worth of art because of his affection for New Zealand and the time he spent down here. He's also developed significant properties which are major tourist attractions. 
which otherwise wouldn't be here if it's not there. So, in my view, if James Cameron comes to New Zealand and ends up making more movies here and various other things, New Zealand will be a strong beneficiary of that. It'll create more jobs. And James Cameron's case, we've done it in a very environmentally sensitive way. So, I personally support people coming in that category. And there'll never be, I say, massive numbers, but there aren't massive numbers of these people around the world. What about the person that just makes the super rich for any other reasons? Well, oh, every country has a category of why people are allowed it. But the, in my view, the category is that they should be able to make a contribution to New Zealand that's positive, bring their skills, bring their capital, hopefully bring their enthusiasm for New Zealand. The vast, overwhelming <coughs> bulk of people that come to New Zealand do not come in the super rich category. They come as students, where they bring you know, their potential skills to play, or they, bring, they come in a category where they're not nearly as well off as these people, but they make a significant contribution. So if you're talking about how do the majority of people come to earn New Zealand residency and ultimately citizenship, it's not because they're super wealthy. The fact that we let a few super wealthy people in, well, they've got to meet the same criteria as everybody else. They've still got to be good citizens. They've still got to be committed to New Zealand, and they've got to be able to make a contribution. In terms of the re-evaluation of where are matters at? Mine says the same for the overseas investment office. Because the indication was in the, in the aftermath of that High Court decision that the government hoped to have, have a re evaluation done within a matter of a couple of weeks. I don't think it's right actually. I think mm -hmm. the Minister actually said it would be in a few days, and I said I don't think it would be near a few days. Okay, so has any sort of time frame beyond that been, been settled as of yet? No. Okay. Have you decided whether to appeal the uh, judge's ruling on this? I think we've decided we're not going to. You're not going to? No, we've looked closely at it and decided yeah. not to. Does the field of appeal by the state of the court complicate matters around the re-evaluation? Uh, no, um, it doesn't. With the well, following the, sorry, following the um, attack in Afghanistan by the American drone yeah. soldier, have you had any reports about heightened tensions or increased risks for, for New Zealand troops in Afghanistan? No. I mean, look, I don't have a great many details about the situation that took place overnight. I mean, obviously, um, I mean, it's an individual who's clearly cracked under the pressure, and it's, uh, it's a tragedy, um, but it probably shows you the level of pressure that some of these soldiers are under. In terms of um, the SAS, are they, are they out here, or are they coming out this month? No, the, the, the fundamentally back at the end of the month, there's a very small piece that will be left just as the Norwegians are taking over from us and just as they transition to the procedure out by the end of March. Have you had any update from police on the TikTok No. Just on the speech, why did you choose Thursday? Uh, well, we, um, believe it or not, serendipity, but we booked it on the, the um, 13th of February. We didn't know that so, David Shearer was giving a speech that day. It takes us more than a couple of days to put together a, a location and then to put together the board. <coughs> where so is your speech, sorry? Uh, it's an awkward chamber of commerce there. But, but you're not unhappy to be delivering a major speech on the same day that the Labour leader is, the new Labour leader is delivering his first major speech as well? Well, I'm not bothered by it. Hopefully he'll do a better job than his private members will. Why is Dr. Wayne? Well, maybe we'll read the next page and won't forget out important things like our natural flora and fauna. Why is Dr. Wayne Matt best qualified to be appointed to the Royal Commission? Well, he's got a PhD in international law. Uh, he's worked in the creation of the law as a both Minister of the Crown and as a Member of Parliament. He's had a distinguished um, career as a lawyer. And, you know, I think he fits all of the criteria. The recommendation came from the Minister, but I was more than happy to support him. Why well, wasn't he mentioned these other candidates who the six names were mentioned in September of last year, but not reconsidered in January of this year? Well, I think he was um, considered. I mean, at the end of the day, that the government always considers all of the potential nominations that it has. It doesn't mean it needs to do further investigation if it thinks there's one stand out. Those other names, according to the pages of the report, which point, they do reach it. Well, I assume they didn't make the same criticisms when when Jeffrey Palmer was appointed. Just because it wasn't right then, does that make it right now? Well, I didn't say Jeffrey Palmer wasn't a right action. So you're satisfied that proper process has been followed uh, in Dr. Matt's appointment? Absolutely. Okay, see you then.